Hello, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us. Um, let me kick off by welcoming everyone to this great debate uh, on the outlook of the transatlantic relationship. My name is Charlotte Matheson, and I will be moderating this discussion under my role as visiting fellow at the German Marshall Fund. Uh, for those, those of you who do not know the German Marshall Fund, we are a nonprofit organization which was founded in 1972 uh, with one core mission. And that mission is to strengthen the transatlantic relationship. We are headquartered in Washington, DC, but have a large footprint, footprint across Europe with offices in, amongst others, Brussels, Berlin, and Paris. Um, so this panel that we are about to have um, very much lies at the core of GMF's mission. The main questions we will ask ourselves is how will the US and the EU interact with each other over the coming years? What can we expect from the new Biden administration based on what we've already seen? And what will happen beyond this, let's say new honeymoon phase that we find ourselves in right now? Where do our panelists see opportunities and hurdles up ahead? And also how can the younger generation of transatlanticists be part of this? I know these are very broad and big picture questions, but we have an excellent panel for you lined up uh, to address all these um, who are experts in a number of these transatlantic topics. Um, but before I introduce the panelists to you, I would also uh, give a quick thank you to the US Embassy to Belgium uh, for their support regarding this event. And a small housekeeping note that for all of you who want to ask your question, uh, please do so via the Q&A box that is provided underneath. Uh, as there is no possibility to kind of raise your hand or anything, and we will uh, obviously hope to address your questions. Now over to the speakers, um, which I give a quick introduction of. Uh, so we have uh, with us Dr. Michael Carpenter, who is Manager Direct Managing Director of the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement, as well as a non-resident fellow of the Atlantic Council. Next up, we have Ambassador O'Sullivan, uh, who is a distinguished fellow at GMF and was the ambassador of the EU to the US from 2014 to 2019, in addition to having a fantastic career in EU foreign policy. Uh, in addition, we also have Ms. Anne Verelst, uh, who is currently a research fellow at the Leuven Center for Global Governance and Studies and who previously was also political counselor at the permanent representation of Belgium to NATO. And last but definitely not least, we have uh, Dr. Bart Sefcik, uh, who is a non-resident fellow uh, with us as well, as well here at GMF and who teaches uh, at uh, Sciences Po in Paris and who has written numerous books about Europe and the transatlantic relationship. So welcome to you all uh, and, and thank you for joining. Um, we'll kick off with some introductory remarks uh, and um, to hear from each, each and each of you, uh, maybe five minutes, uh, so that we then can kind of go into the debate. Um, let me maybe start with uh, Dr. Carpenter um, to hear from you on, let's say, the geopolitical broader perspective and where you see the Biden administration uh, developing in the next four years and where they, you think they're heading, especially when it comes to Europe. Great, thank you so much, Charlotte. Uh, well, let me start out by saying that I am very optimistic about the future course of US-EU relations. Uh, I think we have a tremendous opportunity in front of us. We have just come out of four years of a very unusual period in our history where for the first time in a long time, the US's official position was that the EU was a strategic foe rather than a partner of first resort, as we have seen the EU in the past. And so now we have this tremendous opportunity to build in a number of different areas. And, you know, I won't go into all the details, uh, but, but suffice it to say that, you know, we have opportunities across a broad range of areas. First and foremost, COVID and the post-COVID recovery. Obviously, we need to not only vaccinate our own populations, but we need to cooperate globally in order to ensure that the virus is beaten down and that variant strains don't come back to haunt us, even after our own populations are vaccinated because we have allowed them to flourish in other parts of the world where they've gained a toehold. Um, in the economic arena, similarly, we have a number of challenges, of course, as we always do in the US-EU relationship, which, is, uh, which has always been competitive. Uh, the US, the Boeing Airbus, Airbus dispute, for example, 
uh, is just one example of, of many commercial disputes that, that cross the Atlantic. But there is so much opportunity, especially in terms of regulating digital trade, but also removing barriers uh, to trade, tariff barriers, non-tariff barriers, uh, focusing on, um, on uh, green technologies, um, just a, a tremendous potential agenda that we have in the economic space. Uh, in the security space, likewise, you know, I think that uh, NATO has been chugging along uh, these last four years, despite uh, the sort of the, the emphasis on the 2% and sometimes the denigration of some of our NATO allies coming from Washington. But, you know, in terms of building up uh, a sort of a deterrent capability along the eastern flank of the alliance, we've done well. Uh, and, but there's scope for continuing to adapt the alliance to invest in mobility, in readiness, in the sorts of capabilities that we need, frankly, in the 21st century, whether it's undersea, whether it's space, particularly cyber capabilities, uh, a lot that can be done in that space. Uh, in terms of democracy and governance, again, I think that uh, we have enormous opportunities to, to put our minds together and our collective will uh, to advance democratic norms, both outside of the transatlantic space uh, by acting together to support democratic movements, uh, not democracy promotion in the sort of neoconservative George W. Bush uh, uh, type of mode, but democracy promotion, uh, as you heard uh, Tony Blinken, Secretary of State Blinken articulate yesterday in his first major foreign policy speech. Uh, by advancing uh, democracy in, in smart ways, investing in democracy in those countries where we see an opportunity to, uh, to strengthen those institutions. And then of course, working internally to strengthen democracy in our own nations, uh, making pledges to support basic democratic norms such as the independence of judiciaries, media pluralism, uh, not politicizing law enforcement and intelligence agencies. And then finally, I would say there's a, there's a huge uh, scope for aligning our positions on the sort of the great power competition of the 21st century on Russia, China, uh, Iran. You've already seen that with US diplomacy surrounding Iran, that the US and EU positions have moved much closer together uh, in terms of promoting compliance for compliance with the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. Um, on Russia, I think similarly, you've seen with the response to the poisoning and then imprisonment of Alexei Navalny, a coordinated set of sanctions coming from Brussels and Washington. Um, on China, perhaps a little bit less, but this brings me to the, to the crucial point that I wanna make in my, in my opening five minutes. While I said I'm optimistic and I've just laid out six areas for potential cooperation, I do think that we have to be very conscious of some of the barriers and potentially crossed wires that we will encounter going forward. And to my mind, the biggest obstacle that we face is in terms of thinking about international relations on both sides of the Atlantic. Do we approach our common endeavor, our US-EU relationship from a sort of pragmatic cooperate where you can compete where you must perspective which has adherence uh, both in Washington uh, amongst my colleagues here uh, in the think tank community and perhaps some in government as well. Uh, and certainly on the other side of the Atlantic, or do we take this to another level and do we really see this as a partnership grounded in values two sets of democracies working to advance not only our common interests, but our common values where we see democracy uh, in retreat from advancing techno authoritarianism around the world. And, and, and those will govern two very different sets of responses because if we see great power competition uh, to the extent that we sort of assume a neorealist perspective, then you know from that vantage, it is natural for European powers like a Germany or France to try to position themselves somewhere between the US position and say the Chinese position on trade or between the US position and the Russian position on arms control. You have heard you know, President Macron of France say that he is willing to be the intermediary between the US and Iran. 
And there's nothing wrong with that, let me just be clear. But this is sort of a neorealist position that, that, that states compete in the international arena. Uh, it is natural for each country in the international system to try to advance its own interests above all else. We certainly expect that from countries. Um, but what it leads to is it leads a little bit to this notion, maybe not of equidistance, because I don't think anyone expects that EU member states will be equidistant between, say, Washington and Beijing in the foreseeable future, but at least hedging a little bit between the two. And you've seen that, you know, look, let's be very frank, we have seen that with the conclusion of the, um, of the investment treaty between uh, the EU and China, which was rushed to completion just prior to the uh, inauguration of President Biden, in order to be able to sort of get this done and have a win in the in the EU China column, uh, but without having to engage in in conversations, perhaps even difficult conversations with Washington about how we could uh, stand united uh, against China and and really press with united leverage for ending trade manipulations, uh, technology forced technology transfers subsidies for state-owned enterprises and all the rest of the things that we know that China does. So the question to my mind is, is you know, how do we approach, how do we approach great power competition in the third decade of the 21st century? Is it going to be uh, a neorealist realpolitik approach? And I understand why Europeans might, you know, look at the US after the last four years with, with distrust uh, and think, well, we're open to pragmatic cooperation, but frankly, we foresee uh, that there will be competition with the United States for the foreseeable future. And so we will treat the United States as we treat other countries in the international system. That is certainly one approach, and I understand the rationale and the logic behind it. But there is another approach which is much more ambitious, much more grounded in values, where we recognize that because of our shared values, when we stand together, and we present a united front either to Russia or China or Iran or on any other issue, climate change, uh, you know, vaccinations, uh, dealing with infectious diseases in the future, we can accomplish so much more by pooling resources, by, pool, by have, mounting a collective defense, having collective efforts. That takes, that takes more initiative, it takes uh, political will, and that political will has to be found on both sides of the Atlantic. So I'm optimistic, but we have two visions uh, ahead of us, and we have to be very clear, I think, about which path we choose to take uh, in these coming months. Well, thank you very much, um, Dr. Carpenter, and for your optimism and, uh, and for your for your double scenario, um, Ambassador O'Sullivan. Um, I'd like you to maybe uh, follow up on that with your introductory remarks, um, maybe continuing some of. Dr. Carpenter's points about technology, trade, and maybe even China, if you'd like to elaborate. So um, please, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Charlotte, and uh, thank you, uh, Michael. They were great uh, introductory uh, framing comments, I think, which puts the, 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 the issue and the challenges very, very, very fairly. Um, a couple of observations. I mean, I also am optimistic. I mean, I think the this is a huge opportunity for the transatlantic relationship. I think we need to reinvent it. Um, uh, we call this a partnership to endure. I think we also need to think about future-proofing it. Um, and I, I think we have a small window of opportunity. And unfortunately, the, the window of opportunity is probably even smaller than we think, um, because you can think of it as four years, but you've got the, the, the midterms in, in, in 2022. Uh, you've got uh, German elections this year, you've got French elections next year, you've got Dutch elections uh, coming up and probably, you know, multiple other EU elections that I, I'm, I'm not fully giving the full calendar, but you can be sure there's, 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 there's more than a couple around the corner. So, you know, the, the, the domestic political agenda, as always, risks to sort of take over from any rather more, you know, high-flying concepts of, of transatlantic partnership and I think we need to be sensitive to that um, I think the other point I, I would say Michael and, and I you know I think you're absolutely right that we can either approach this on a, a purely sort of pra pragmatic semi-transactional approach or we can try to take it to a, a slightly higher level uh, on the other hand I think um, you know we don't know what's going to happen in America in in 2024 um, and and we have seen 
uh, that you know someone like Trump can 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 take over and can dramatically change things. So you will understand that you know on the European side, people are more than willing to engage. I think with this administration, and it's probably the most pro-European, if I can use that phrase, administration we've seen in a very, very long time when you look at the, the, the composition. Um, on the other hand, people say, well, you know, we have to also uh, take into account that that might not be there forever. Um, so I, I, I think that's the, the discussion we have to have, uh, and it won't be a, a simple one. Um, I also think that we have to be honest that America is changing. Um, the, the demographics of America are changing uh, by 2045. I think uh, Caucasian Americans, if I can use that expression, or Americans of Caucasian origin will, will, will be in a minority. And in fact, the majority will be, you know, Hispanics, African Americans, uh, Asian Americans, uh, and so forth. And those people are not going to feel the same sense of affinity with Europe that the Caucasian Americans, largely of European origin, did. The Irish Americans, the Italian Americans, the German Americans, Belgian Americans um, uh, will not feel this sense of, of, of investment in the relationship for those reasons. They will have to see that this is a, a relationship that delivers for America and for American workers and for American security, America's competitiveness in the world. And I think that's a, an exercise we do need to work on. And I'll say one of the things I said when I was leaving as ambassador was we need to massively invest in people to people uh, transfers and moves because there's much less of that going on of course none at all now with covid but um, much less of that going on generally and this is where the german marshall fund has done great work but we we need very large numbers of of young people uh, crossing the atlantic in both directions to to recreate a new generation of uh, of ties and connections uh, which are not naturally there and will be even less so uh, into the future now i think we have to be honest and say that you know there is a risk that we will both disappoint each other, <laughs> that this administration will, will disappoint the Europeans and the Europeans will disappoint this administration. It's, we've seen it before. So while I, I share Michael's optimism, I think we need to be a bit careful about overselling this uh, uh, too soon because uh, we also have to be realistic. I mean, on the trade stuff, uh, I, I think there are opportunities, but to be very frank, I think it's very clear this is not gonna be a priority for this administration. Uh, trade is, is, is going to be much lower down the, the, the priority than, than, than dealing with the pandemic, than, than dealing with the economic recovery, than dealing with American competitiveness and, and uh, the situation of American workers, the American middle class, uh, all the points that President Biden has been you know, making very, uh, uh, very, in a very articulate way, describing what he sees as the challenges. Uh, and therefore, so I think you know, we should not be... Um, excessively optimistic that we will see, you know, dramatic resolutions of Airbus Boeing, though I think it, it, is, a it is an issue which is ripe for a solution, but whether we can get there, I don't know. I see that the, the US has lifted the retaliatory tariffs uh, on the UK only, uh, and uh, has said that they've, they've given themselves four months to find a solution with the UK. Interesting that they want to find a solution with the UK, considering that Airbus is a consortium. <laughs> involving several several member states and and i think a solution with one member state alone will not really solve the problem but anyway uh, uh let's see uh, i don't think the steel and aluminium tariffs which are particular irritant to the europeans because they really felt these were supposed to get china and in fact they got the europeans i don't see them being lifted anytime soon uh, um so I, I, you know we are going to face some difficult moments uh on the tech stuff uh I think there are opportunities there, particularly on next generation tech, you know, uh, AI, 6G even rather than 5G. I think these are areas where we could certainly talk about standards and about cooperation. Um, uh, I see where uh, Eric Schmidt of, uh, was it Eric Schmidt of, of Google who said um, uh, that, you know, Europe and the US both on their own were not able, would not be able to take on the challenge of, of artificial intelligence. I'm sure that's absolutely right. Um, and I, I think on China, this is definitely going to be uh, a, a very, very important issue, but also a difficult issue. Um, because unfortunately, uh, in the US, um, a, a rather hawkish approach on China has kind of taken root, and particularly on the Hill, uh, and for, in a fairly bipartisan way. And while I have you know, some sympathy for it, I, I think ultimately it is not the best way to, to try and deal with China's place in the global commons in the 21st century. Uh, if we slide into another Cold War with China, 
uh, uh, this is going to end badly, frankly, uh, and we need to be aware of that. So we need uh, an appropriate blend of confrontation with all the things that Michael described that we don't like about China, and yet a willingness to engage and give them a stake in the global system uh, that makes them also want to think differently about the, the way they, they need to behave. Um, this will not be easy. Uh, and I think getting our act together on this is going to be challenging also because to be very frank on the European side, we don't have unanimity of view amongst our member states as to how we should deal with this issue. Um, I don't think it's a question of Europe being, um, uh, being um, what's the word I'm looking for, equidistant or, 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 or neutral. I don't think we, we are neutral vis-a-vis -vis the United States and, and, and China, but I think people are wary of being sucked into uh, a, a sort of uh, zero-sum game approach to relations with China, uh, which uh, does not give us a, 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 a a win-win outcome uh, in terms of how we rebuild uh, that relationship. And I think this is something which we need to discuss. Uh, I think it goes beyond any of the bits and pieces of the relationship, whether that's Huawei or whether that is um, uh, the Uyghurs or, or Hong Kong or Taiwan. I, I think we need a bigger conversation, including with our Asian allies, about how we how we're going to deal with the the, the growing the, the growing strength and and importance of China as an economic and as a political actor in the 21st century and what's our strategy for making that uh, a, a process which does not inexorably lead us to confrontation and then possibly uh, even even uh, violent confrontation if if it were ever to be mishandled so I think that's a, a, a an important conversation whether we can do all of this. Um, with the domestic agenda, the politics, uh, uh, you know, remains to be seen. But I, I, I think uh, on, on, on certainly on the, this new U.S. team contains a fantastic team of, of, of very sophisticated uh, thinkers, uh, people who've you know given a lot of thought to what they want to do in this role with President Biden. So I, I do, in the end, share share Michael's optimism, even if I see the pitfalls. Well, thank you, uh, yes, for uh, continuing that streak of optimism. Let's, uh, uh, let's see if that's the same for everybody else on the panel. Uh, <laughs> moving on to Ms. Berelst, um, it would be great to hear your uh, views uh, on, on the topic and especially from a member state perspective. Um, so we'd love to hear uh, your perspective, especially regarding Belgium and how they look at the transatlantic relationship. Thank you very much. It is said that the Biden administration does not want to restore the transatlantic relationship, but wants to reinvent it. And so far, Belgium has welcomed this and talked about a mutual trust restored and expressed its readiness to engage on the uh, reinventing and restoring efforts. Belgian Foreign Minister uh, Sophie Wilmes expects agreements on four major issues and hopes to cooperate on three issues where some disagreement might be expected. Let us perhaps walk to, to these four plus three areas today together. First of all, uh, Belgium expects agreement on strengthening multilateralism together with their American friends. And in that sense, the recent US announcements of uh, returning to the Paris Agreement, re-engaging with the Human Rights Council, its intention to revive the Iran nuclear deal is music to the ears of those close to Belgian foreign policy. After all, multilateralism is at the heart of Belgian diplomacy. Second of all, the Belgian foreign minister expects agreement on economic and trade recovery after COVID. Thirdly, she sees a possibility for defending democracy and human rights together. And in that vein, as an example, it is likely that both sides of the Atlantic will take a more critical stance towards Russia's international law obligations. Like Michael has said, this week we saw how the US coordinated its sanctions after over the Navalny sentencing with Europe. Fourthly, a new 
transatlantic momentum for a more ambitious international disarmament and arms control agenda seems to have emerged. And Belgium is encouraging the US and Russia to do even more while applauding the positive signals that we have seen during the early days of the Biden presidency. Disarmament as an opportunity for transatlantic and even global cooperation is also put forward by the EU in its important EU-US global agenda and by the NATO Secretary General. Now, this restored mutual trust between Belgium and the US should also allow them to work together on issues where they might be divergent views. And Belgian Foreign Minister Sophie Wilmes has identified three challenges in this regard. One, the digital taxation plans of big tech firms. Two, how to address the emerging role of China. And three, the US sanctions against the International Criminal Court. In all of his restoring efforts, Belgium might have expected that by now, Biden, President Biden would have lifted the US sanctions against the International Criminal Court, sanctions that the Trump administration enacted towards the officials of the court and their families after the court decided to investigate US conduct in Afghanistan. Belgium, again, as a staunch defender of multilateralism, is calling up the on the US to reverse those sanctions. But we see how it can get tricky here, because yes, lifting those sanctions would put Biden's words about multilateralism into action. Yet the US is still opposed to the International Criminal Court launching these investigations. I think this illustrates how, yes, we have shifted, and, and quite dramatically so, from a transactional, at times tit for tat approach to foreign policy, to a US foreign policy, which is very much welcomed by Belgian and European officials alike, but one of which the success will also be measured against the extent of transatlantic cooperation on issues where there is disagreement. In essence, Restoring and reviving the transatlantic cooperation to mean working together when there is agreement and when there is disagreement, that is a way to cement the transatlantic bond in the 21st century. Thank you very much, Mr. Elst. Um, I, I see a lot of uh, commonalities with some of the challenges and opportunities that the other speakers have already pointed out uh, from a, let's say, member state perspective and EU perspective, hearing a lot of China, um, digital tax uh, technology in general being both opportunity and potential hurdle. Um, yeah, so I think quite a bit of ground has already been covered, so that will make it difficult for you, but, <laughs> and, but would love to hear your thoughts on any other uh, elements that you think in the transatlantic relationship we, we should really look out for in the next four years um, before we turn it into a broader discussion, because we already have quite a few questions coming in. Great. <clears throat> thanks so much, Charlotte, and thanks so much to all the all my co-panelists. And as you point out, Charlotte, a lot of what I would have wanted to say has been said already only better. Uh, so let me just make uh, give a, my own twist on some of the themes that have been expressed by my uh, friends and colleagues here. Uh, one is to double down on Michael's uh, optimism and to encourage David's further optimism, uh, because I, I, I saw it there at the end, although it was, uh, there was an internal struggle, and to emphasize that you know, we should really be thinking about uh, partnership. And uh, as Michael pointed out, you know, partners of first resort, which is that uh, Europe and America should rely on each other and look to each other as partners of first resort in meeting our common challenges. And that should be kind of the instinctual starting point for anything that we think about in foreign policy. And that partners of first resort does not mean only resort. So obviously there are lots of allies and partners in, in Asia, in Africa, Latin America, uh, and elsewhere where um, you know, we'll need other allies and partners to, uh, to join efforts to be able to meet our common challenges. But you know, we do 
need to start somewhere and that the transatlantic partnership is essentially the core engine for wider effective multilateralism, wider global collective action. You know, President Biden called the transatlantic uh, partnership uh, sort of the cornerstone uh, for global action at his Munich Security Conference speech a couple of weeks ago. And, and I think that cannot be overemphasized because sometimes, you know, uh, leaders or uh, analysts can get sidetracked with, you know, um, divergent interests, uh, visions of autonomy or, you know, conflicting trends and great power competition and so forth. But I think as a, as a good instinctual default starting point, we should remember uh, the transatlantic partnership. And let me give you a quick sort of real politique reason why uh, that should be the case. So um, I've been toying with this idea of writing an article on managing the rise of the West. And it's not about sort of a backward looking, you know, historical essay, but where we are in the current moment, which is that, you know, notwithstanding, sure, China's tremendous economic growth over the past four decades and into the foreseeable future, the truth is that the countries that you could call the West or you know, part of a wider liberal order uh, have still commanded uh, a preponderance of material resources and uh, essentially of power in the world since World War II, but the composition of the West has shifted over time. And so let's say if you look to 1945, uh, most of global GDP and military spending were in the hands of the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, three quarters of GDP and uh, uh, more than half of military spending. Uh, by 1950, that evened out a little bit, but basically over the past seven decades, uh, more than half of global GDP and more than half of military spending have resided in uh, the hands of uh, Western countries of Europe, America, and their allies in, in Asia and elsewhere. And essentially the reason why we've been able to make a success out of it over time is because we've been able to grow that community over time through institutions like NATO, within Europe itself, through the EU that integrated both Western Europe and uh, Central and Eastern Europe and other institutions that you know, reach out and basically uh, are able to aggregate power, aggregate resources, uh, among uh, along a sort of a common vision. And I think that is very important to remember. If you uh, look to the current uh, Biden-Harris team's uh, thinking, and actually, you know, they've just released the interim national security uh, strat strategic guidance just yesterday, sort of a preliminary document uh, to the national security strategy. And strikingly, you know, only within five to six weeks of being in office that they've put out their own uh, sort of vision of America's role in the world and so forth. Uh, that document talks about a lot of things, but one of the central themes of the document and of the team's strategic thinking is the need for allies and partners for the US to be able to do, uh, to uh, be successful in its foreign policy endeavors. And if that, apply, that logic applies to the United States, for sure it applies to individual European countries, be it France, Germany, Italy, the United Kingdom, as well as for larger organizations like the European Union. And if you uh, accept that proposition, and I think it's sort of a no brainer, then you think about, okay, uh, which allies and partners are we talking about? And then we fall back to the initial point about the centrality of the transatlantic partnership, because that's where uh, the predominant resources still lie. And that's where you can rally countries around a common agenda, not as an endpoint, you know, not as a kind of only resort, but as a first resort to then have a wider effective uh, multilateral effort. Uh, let me mention a couple of a couple on a couple of other points that were uh, discussed by Michael and uh, and David and and Anne, which is that you know sometimes this notion of transatlantic partnership is uh, positioned. Um, as opposed to you know, European strategic autonomy or European sovereignty, and that somehow these two concepts are in tension with each other. And I would just say on that, um, because I'm sure 
there are some questions out there in the in the audience that uh, are ready to pounce on this issue. That sure, some interpretations of European strategic autonomy. If you're thinking about, um, you know, uh, Charles de Gaulle's notions of strategic autonomy, which was essentially to do things unilaterally uh, on France's own, you know, evicting NATO from French territory and withdrawing from NATO's um, uh, military structures. Yes, those concepts of strategic autonomy would be in tension with, with partnership, with transatlantic partnership, just as they were in the 1960s as de Gaulle uh, implemented it. But that's not my understanding of where the center of gravity in European uh, elite, uh, official, and public opinion is. And instead, the notion is, look, you basically, uh, Europe, or European countries individually and Europe at large want to be able to have greater capabilities to be able to do things uh, in partnership with the United States and in partnership with other countries. And that, I think, is fully compatible with uh, the vision of transatlantic partnership and with the uh, approach of the new Biden-Harris team. Um, let me just make one final point uh, before turning it back to you, uh, Charlotte, and to Q and A, which is that, you know, sure, four years is not a long time, but it still gives a plenty of opportunities to do things and to accomplish things jointly, uh, and we should sort of move past the uh, the previous four years, which were very difficult on both sides of the Atlantic. But at the same time, we should not live in the fear of the future and somehow, you know, be hamstrung or shell shocked uh, by the recent past from doing things in the present and in the near and medium term future, which are good and constructive and collaborative. Because, you know, um, we have plenty to do uh, four years or eight years or longer. Um, still provides a plenty of opportunity to do those things. And as the Biden-Harris team showed yesterday with this uh, new strategic document, you could get a lot of things done in a um, relatively short period of time. You know, by comparison, the EU has gone through its own strategic review process over the past uh, year and a half or so, the strategic compass uh, internal threat analysis. Uh, and I think it would be quite useful to have these types of discussions, you know, really deep dives on strategy and on outlook for the world uh, jointly so that we can come up with uh, a coherent view, not only on panels like this, which I'm sure will come to a single uh, set of conclusions at the end, but uh, between European countries and uh, the United States and Canada and other um, allies and partners, uh, because if we don't engage in those, you know, deep dive strategic discussions at, at that level, uh, I think all the individual decisions, be it on digital tax or trade or technology or China or Russia or uh, climate change and a whole host of other issues uh, will just be more difficult and will take more time to get through. But let me pause there. Thank you so much, Bart. And um, uh, before I hand it over uh, to the audience, because there's already quite a few questions uh, coming in, I want to take the prerogative as moderator uh, to piggyback a little bit on, on what you've said and, and pose a general question to you all. Um, you were uh, talking a lot about uh, uh, you know, the EU, EU strategy, uh, for example, Bart at the end, uh, about the uh, you know, development of its own strategy for the past year and a half, uh, about some elements that, that, um, that have you know, uh, evolved in the last couple of years. And so my question to you is, as we've looked a lot to the US and what has changed and the clear kind of reset that we are seeing, what's happened with Europe? Uh, you know, as, as, as Biden picks up the proverbial phone uh, to call Europe, Will he find the same Europe that that uh, you know he had he knew as vice president four years ago, um, and 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 what ex what do you think will be maybe the the main surprises from the U.S. side uh, when when engaging with Europe uh, compared to maybe how the Obama, Obama administration uh, was was working with Europe? Um, so we'd love to hear your thoughts. Maybe I don't know Ambassador O'Sullivan if you would like to uh, kick off there or anybody else. 
Ambassador, I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah, and I, I wanted to um, because somebody somebody commented that my mic was not is the volume was low. Is that better? It's it's much better. Yes, I think it was only slightly in the beginning, but I think we can hear you fine. If it's not the case, please also reach out to me and, and we'll, um, we'll let you know. No, I, I you know, I, I think we need to be frankly realistic. Uh, I mean, relations, transatlantic relationship were not, you know, entirely rosy during the Obama administration either. I mean, I, I think there are there are structural tensions there which we've kind of touched on, which are not going to go away. I mean, we, we don't have identical interests. We may have very similar shared values. We may occasionally our interests may align, but they also diverge from time to time. And I think that the, the trick is is maximizing the, the ones where we converge and kind of, if, if not minimizing, then at least uh, not overemphasizing when we when we disagree. Um, but you know, it's it's not simple um, because um, the, on, on the European side, uh, we don't always have a unanimous view. I mean, you, you say you know this famous f f uh, telephone number question. I mean, I, I sometimes when I was in Washington used to say, well, tell me the, the single number you should call in Washington to get the American position, right? Between between the White House and between the Hill and between uh, uh, the different elements of, of the U.S. the U.S. system, it can also be uh, slightly cacophonous at times. Uh, so I, I think, you know, because because both our systems are, are democracies and, and pluralists by definition, there is no, you know, there is no supreme leader who kind of decides everything and, and who makes everything happen. Um, I, I think there is going to be an element of kind of figuring out how closely we want to work. I mean, I think that's Michael's initial point. Um, are we just going back to a generally constructive approach or are we going to engage in a kind of, you know, as Bart suggested, a deeper dive where we really try and um, align ourselves on, on a couple of, of key issues? Uh, I, I would love to think we could do that, um, but I'm also conscious that it won't necessarily be easy on either side. Um, if I was looking at it from the European perspective, I would say that one of the difficulties sometimes with the US is the process of kind of interagency work and, and defining a US position can sometimes you know, get them to the point where when they come to engage with partners and allies, there isn't an awful lot of flexibility in the position. It's kind of, this is, this is what we've decided we have to do and would you like to join us rather than this is the problem, uh, here's our solution, what do you think and what could be our joint solution, right? And uh, um, so I'm not, and equally, if you were in Washington, you could make the same complaint about the Europeans, absolutely. So how we, the mechanics of how this is organized will also be important in my view. And I, I, I hope some thinking is going into that. Thank you very much. Um, maybe I might uh, add on to that. Uh, we have quite a few questions um, indeed regarding this whole value-based versus pr pragmatism uh, approach on transatlantic relations and especially if we would choose for the value-based model, and this is me just summarizing a couple of questions together for you all, if we would uh, work from the value-based uh, perspective, how would that then work in, for example, relations with joint relations with China, Russia, Iran? How, how do you see that developing? Uh, uh, do you see there any potential overlap which could create cooperation? Um, I guess maybe because you're the first one who brought it up, I'm going to hand this one first to Michael, but everyone else feel free to let me know if you'd like to jump in on that as well. Sure, thanks Charlotte. So let me take China first. Look, <clears throat> I think the challenge is, as uh, David O'Sullivan has uh, properly identified, if we don't want this to be the sort of zero sum game competition where we start to escalate risks and our European friends start to get skittish about a very hawkish American policy that could pull them into some sort of geopolitical confrontation. Um, at the same time, if our European friends approach China simply as just another competitor in the international system with whom they can negotiate and certainly they can negotiate market access for their companies um, on preferential terms, um, then you know, that approach can lead precisely to this sort of, maybe not equidistance, but it can lead to a lack of unity 
amongst members of the transatlantic community. And if that comes to pass, if we if we have a sort of a lack of unity, we agree that that you know that, that China should get better on human rights. We agree that China should should grant more market access. We agree that the playing field for our economic competition should be level, but we approach it from our own narrow interest-based perspective, we will fail. We will fail. Um, you know, I you know, I, I spent the first part uh, bashing sort of um, this notion of uh, neorealism. But I also would like to bash this notion of modernization theory that as we trade more with China, um, as we engage in deeper dialogue, that the Chinese will become a responsible stakeholder in the international system. Let's not fool ourselves. The Chinese Communist Party is a authoritarian uh, party that wishes to uh, engage in the sort of technocratic surveillance type authoritarian oligarchic system that, that leaves no room for compromise with Western democratic values. And so a values-based approach to China means standing together, not always with Europeans fully on board with say what the US Navy is doing in the South China Sea, but at least standing together on sort of principles of human rights, on principles of free and fair, uh, economic relations, uh, for example, intellectual property theft, harmonizing our investment screening mechanisms, harmonizing some of our counterintelligence operations so that the Chinese cannot simply just walk in and steal our innovative know-how and then apply it to their, uh, to their own uh, technologies and to their own economic development. So, what, what, I'm, what I'm trying to say here is that, again, there's, there's two different roads that we can go down with China. We can go down one where we broadly agree and we issue common statements on things like repression of democracy in Hong Kong and how the Chinese treat the Uyghurs. Um, and you know we can both issue joint sternly worded statements. But if we don't follow it up with a very concrete set of aligned policies, and I agree, the US, look, we, we've dragged our European friends into a war in Iraq that has done untold damage. I understand, I understand very well the reluctance to always follow the US lead, especially when it's being articulated by some of the same hawkish individuals who you know, previously advocated a, a reconceptualization of the balance of power in the Middle East. And look where that goes. I get it, I get it. But, but if, we, if we approach China, if we approach Russia um, with, with different positions, we will be less successful in the end run in achieving what is really our common goal. And that common strategic goal is both to advance democratic values and norms, but also to have precisely a level playing field in the economic arena so that European states and European companies can in fact do business with China, but do business on a level field. And, and, and we want the same for our companies and we're gonna continue to have uh, you know, uh, differences over carbon border taxes and on Boeing, Airbus and all the rest of that because we are competitors as well, but we share those common values and that's where we have to apply them. So I hope that example sort of elucidates a little bit what I meant by a values-based approach. And thank you, Michael. I think Bart, you also wanted to uh, intervene on that. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> let me just jump in quickly. If you, yeah, you know, I mentioned both the strategic guidance that was issued yesterday by the Biden Harris team and also the strategic compass. And the issue of China is quite prominent in yesterday's document. And, you know, um, the administration speaks about uh, a long term strategic competition with China in which the US can only be successful if it rallies allies and partners around the common vision. If, you look at the strategic compass process, and I've asked a number of people uh, who are part of it, apparently the issue of China, regardless of how you approach it, has, hasn't even been discussed as part of this year and a half uh, strategic review process, which is quite striking. And so my first starting point would be that we do need a deep dive uh, into some of these issues and we need them together because in the end, I think we 
will ultimately end up at similar positions if we go through this exercise, uh, because we do have underlying common values and common interests. Uh, but we, you know, it, it, it doesn't happen automatically. You need to be able to kind of think through a complex set of challenges. And so that, you know, we don't just focus on near term commercial interests, like let's say that are behind the EU China comprehensive agreement on investment, but you also take into account some of the long-term considerations that, uh, that need to be taken into account. Uh, and the reason why I'm hopeful that that discussion can lead into uh, an ultimate uh, good endpoint is that, you know, you mentioned Charlotte that I teach at Sciences Po and actually just this afternoon, uh, our session was on China and whether Europe and America can come together uh, to develop a joint strategy and it was striking that, you know, without any prodding or anything, but just, you know, after uh, 10 sessions or so of going through how you should think about developing strategy, uh, the students were more or less singing from the same hymn sheet. Uh, and, um, you know, because ultimately there's actually no conflict between interests and values. It's just what interests do you take into account? Is it, you know, near term commercial interests or is it your interest in shaping? a wider world order that is conducive to your uh, democratic and human rights institutions at home. And I would uh, finally um, just gesture to one thing that also makes me optimistic, which is that, you know, the Biden-Harris team's document speaks quite extensively to the linkage between domestic policy and foreign policy and how you need to be engaged in the world to uh, be stronger at home and vice versa, how you're domestic strength plays in your ability to uh, shape the world. And actually, you know, in Europe, you see um, sort of slivers of this thinking as well. There's a recent European Commission document on multilateralism and how uh, the reason why Europe needs to be engaged in the world is because it has a stake uh, in shaping international institutions, shaping the international environment, in a way that is conducive to uh, democratic institutions at home in Europe, uh, at the EU level, and also in individual European countries. If you read that document and that uh, thinking, it's quite similar to, um, for the historical buffs on the, on the call, to uh, the way you know, the U United States started shifting its thinking in the aftermath, uh, during and in the aftermath of World War II, which is to realize that you know, it needed to be present um, across the world to be able to protect some of it, the, the interests uh, and values at home. And so um, I think for that, you know, again, we need to sort of come together and to figure out exactly where do we need to be present and in what way and how do we trade off near-term interests and long-term considerations. Thank you, Bart. Uh, I think Ambassador Sullivan, you also wanted to um, intervene here. Uh, I saw you. Uh... Oh, just very, very um, I mean, just on, on the comprehensive agreement on, on investment. I mean, firstly, this is not actually concluded. Uh, it was a, a political deal was reached, uh, but we don't even have a full text. Uh, it's going to be signed probably in the autumn and ratified next year. So we have a long way to go before we actually see this uh, enter into, into force. And, you know, there are different views within Europe once we actually see the text, including in the European Parliament. But secondly, I, I think the notion that somehow, you know, it was wrong of the Europeans to, 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 to conclude this politically at the end of the year is, is a bit misplaced. I mean, um, we, we, we've been negotiating this damn thing for seven years, as have the Americans, by the way, also in parallel doing a, an investment agreement. And the Americans kind of slightly short circuited by going with the phase one deal, which Trump did, which actually got the US some of the things that they, they were hoping to get in the agreement. Equally, the, the Europeans at the beginning of last year said that it was our hope that we could conclude this thing at the end of 2020. Um, it would have looked a bit strange, to be perfectly honest with you, when the pieces fell into place on both sides of the deal, uh, not, to, not to have gone ahead. I mean, I think it would have looked very strange. But it is not the, the last word on, on relations with China. And by the way, there are actually things in this agreement, if it ever does get signed and ratified, and I recognize that will be challenging. But on the substance, there's actually quite a lot of stuff in there which will also be beneficial 
vision for the US and for, and for many of our allies and partners because China is binding on an MFN basis. Uh, some important uh, changes to their, their system, which they had not previously been willing to do. So, you know, I, again, I, I absolutely agree with Michael, and I think he put it very well, that, it, you know, we should not be naive into thinking that purely through engagement, everything will be fine with China. There will be moments when we need to be very tough and we need to be very strong in opposing Chinese uh, behavior. On the other hand, I do think we need to find a way of also giving them some sense of stake in the international community that they don't feel what we're doing is, is kind of encircling them with a threatening alliance, which will only make them even more resistant to change and create risks uh, of the kind that Michael, Michael hinted at. So that's, that's the balance. And I, I don't think it's easy, but that's the conversation we need to be having. Uh, thank you, Ambassador. Indeed, uh, uh, engaging with uh, an actor like China at the global stage is, is a balancing act that I don't think is, is that on everybody's mind and is a bit uh, some uh, big question here. Um, maybe uh, referring back to some of the things um, Mr. Hels also said from the Belgian perspective uh, about the importance of multilateralism, uh, there are a number of um, stages of multilateralism that the US is joining again. Uh, we're talking about the climate pact, we're talking uh, about re-engagement in you know, WHO, uh, maybe even also a different attitude towards the WTO, um, uh, also hopefully maybe a different attitude in NATO. Um, Ms. Verrost, do, could you maybe elaborate a little bit on that? We've, we're receiving quite a few questions regarding uh, those platforms and how you think the EU and US will engage uh, there and whether their strategy might change. Um, yes. Yeah. Thank you very much. I think we are now still in a stage of restoring and of a lot of very welcome measures, but also quite symbolical, such as uh, the desire to um, revamp the uh, Iran nuclear deal or the appointment of the Director General of the World Trade Organization. That went through, that is something that the Trump administration blocked, but then the more substantial issue of how to reform the World Trade Organization, for example, still um, lingers on. And if you look at the EU-US uh, global agenda for change, you will see that the EU is preparing to take joint leadership with the US in reforming not only the World Trade Organization, but also the World Health Organization, very relevant now with the um, COVID crisis. So, and it remains to be seen how then afterwards the policies um, can uh, converge. And on NATO, if I may add, I wanted to add something uh, on NATO, sorry. Um, I think there is tremendous opportunity now um, with the new US administration uh, on NATO. That is first and foremost, because we have a president that now um, aligns its position with Europe on the ter territorial integrity and sovereignty of Ukraine and takes a more critical stance towards Russia in that respect. Uh, there is a NATO 2030 agenda that is coming out soon. Concrete proposals will be launched. And that is where NATO EU cooperation could be so interesting in terms of um, capability development and on taking this momentum to bring NATO in the 21st uh, century by developing together, supporting investments in um, systems to tackle hybrid threats, to tackle um, cyber, space, artificial intelligence. Those are things on which the new US administration and European NATO member allies seem to agree. Uh, broadly on. So there's tremendous opportunity there. Of course, not everything is rosy. The 2% discussion is likely uh, to continue. Although also there, there might be ways to um, reinvent it and tie it perhaps more to uh, capability development. But tremendous opportunities there to strengthen multilateralism if we go slowly from the restoring into the true reinventing moments. It will be interesting to see how, because the policy reviews of the Biden administration are still ongoing, uh, so we can only take hints from his appointment so far, his speeches to the Munich Security Conference, his speeches to um, the State Department and the G7, and we see a lot of agreements there, but it will be highly interesting to compare the outcome of the US policy reviews 
to the EU-US agenda for global change and all the new initiatives to strengthen multilateralism that the EU has suggested there, amongst which a uh, new EU-US dialogue on China, for example, uh, and on reforming uh, and on creating a trade and technology council. Thank you, Anne. Um, anybody else would like to comment on that? Or um, is there an, can I go to another uh, question? I see um, Michael, uh, yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't take care. mind saying, well, I, I, I very much agree with Anne. I think there is a tremendous opportunity for advancing NATO-EU cooperation in the years ahead on a relatively non-controversial set of issues, namely building our democratic resilience. I mean, if you think hard about what threats have caused the most damage to, say, U.S. national security over the last 12 months, it's a deadly virus, uh, a conspiracy uh, born out of disinformation, and, and, and third, probably cyber attacks and the tremendous economic damage that they've done. Um, it, you know, it, far more than what any, you know, bombers or submarines or missiles could ever achieve. Um, and so we, we really have an agenda that is just waiting to be tackled that is probably a joint NATO-EU agenda that brings, to, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> that brings to bear NATO's defense capabilities and the EU's governance tools to do things like harden our, our cybersecurity, uh, harden our financial institutions against uh, money laundering and malign financial influence, uh, harmonize our regulations in the information sphere so that we get at the, the algorithms and business models that actually support uh, toxic disinformation. Um, so I, I, I'm very hopeful that in, in this set of issues, as Anne said, that we can really achieve a lot of progress going forward. Oh, thanks, Michael. Um, we ha only have a, a bit under 15 minutes left, um, but I um, wanted to um, maybe follow up on, on let's say, a, a very pragmatic uh, question uh, that I think all of you have raised to some extent, which is, um, you know, what's going to happen in the next uh, in the next six months to year with with the post pandemic situation on both sides of the Atlantic and where are hurdles and, and opportunities there? Uh, we're already seeing, uh, you know, the recovery packages coming or initiatives coming from both sides. Um, there are some elements even where people are saying, look, uh, for, for even, you, you could even have some trade issues here uh, with some of the elements that are, that are in these recovery plans. Are there also opportunities where, you know, as we are both trying to, to pick up economy losses, which I think globally are on an average of minus five percent, if not more. Um, how do we how do we come out uh, from this uh, in, in a way that we could maybe take this up as an opportunity uh, for not just the economy on both sides, but also um, engagement on a global level, for example, vaccination diplomacy, um, you know, working with other countries, etc. Um, it will be interesting to hear your views on how you know the post pandemic strategy could actually be a good example of, of, of what can come out of this transatlantic new transatlantic relationship good and and bad potentially um who would like to take the floor i see bart nodding enthusiastically um so hence why i might give it to you if you're willing but um please uh feel free to jump in here um yeah well <clears throat> i could just give a few initial uh thoughts which is that you know the pace of recovery will be a little bit different across the Atlantic, unfortunately. Um, you know, on the good side, on the optimistic note, uh, the US, you know, with its uh, several uh, producers of va COVID-19 vaccines uh, and a pretty rapid vaccination plan now, you know, is on track to um, reaching herd immunity, whether by June or July or, you know, end of the summer, certainly with um, the recent announcement between uh, of the um, uh, initiative between Johnson Johnson and Merck to produce uh, the Johnson Johnson vaccine. Uh, the UK has also been a, a, on a pretty good pace to reach herd immunity and has impressive vaccination rates. On the EU side, the picture is a little bit different and uh, it's been a much uh, slower process for a number of reasons that we don't need to necessarily 
cover here, but um, you know uh, the vaccination rates right now are at a relatively low level, and given the disruptions in supply lines and so forth, it's unclear exactly when um, the EU will reach herd immunity when you know most of its or seventy percent of its adult population will be vaccinated, and that will hold up any talk about real economic recovery because obviously you're not going to be able to restart all the services and and, and consumption that um, uh, the EU economy is, is dependent on as you will in the UK and the US. So that I think is, is, is a slight, um, slightly worrying uh, picture, but it's just the underlying reality. Uh, I think it also illustrates that we need to think creatively about how we do things and how we sort of reach decisions and whether our current institutional structure is fit for purpose. And I completely agree with Michael that there are lots of opportunities for additional NATO EU cooperation. And, and it's great that the US and the EU uh, partnership is back on track. But in some ways, if you think about it, you know, NATO in the end will be inherently primarily a military uh, collective defense organization because that's what it was designed to and that's what it is best at. Uh, and the EU uh, will also have you know, a specific agenda that's not going to be all encompassing. And so in some ways we need to have, and then also you know, when you have meetings between the US president and the EU leadership, that obviously doesn't include necessarily all of the EU member states, uh, national leaders. And so in some ways we need the inclusive membership of NATO and we need the, the broader agenda of the US EU and maybe kind of a reconfigured way in which we get together and exchange information and analyses and reach decisions. And what I'm envisioning is some structure where uh, issues like public health would naturally fit uh, under the overall umbrella where you know the US Center for Disease Control would have discussions with the European counterpart, not only at the EU level, which is quite limited, but also uh, at individual national uh, member state levels. And so uh, I think it's also a time for creative thinking in terms of, you know, what is the next chapter in transatlantic cooperation that we'll, we'll write together? And I don't think it necessarily will be confined to just NATO or US-EU cooperation. Uh, thank you, Bart. Uh, anybody else would like to jump in on that question? Um, um, uh, yes, please go ahead. Uh, you're still on mute. <laughs> yes, now it's unmuted. Thank you um, very much. I would like to pick up on that because I think it also reflects something more large. There are a lot of commentators that say that the success of the transatlantic cooperation and to engage younger audiences, that was a question for today as well, in that success is tangible results, no longer defending liberal international order, but tangible results. And I think this one word, or is it two, Pfizer BioNTech really represents that success and innovation and research and what we can um, achieve together. And um, there are some very hopeful signals. The EU wanted the US to join uh, and physically and financially participate in COVAX, uh, which the US administration has now announced. But there are two other points that the EU puts forward. That is that it hopes that the US joins EU efforts in global equal distribution of tests and treatments around the world. And we saw that medical and macro specifically pointed out um, Africa in this regards at the recent, most recent Munich, Munich Security Conference. So it will be interesting to see how we can engage the US, uh, how the US can engage with the EU um, on that. And then another point is that, yes, um, as Bart said, the vaccination in Europe is more slow and it is creating frustration. And we see that some European capitals are looking towards um, acquiring vaccines from other countries than the US. And although this is not the place to discuss that, we should avoid that that becomes a, an issue of irritants between the US and the EU, that this vaccination strategy and acquisition is, um, does not become a reflection, a reflection of a longer global 
power competition issue. Yeah, thank you. Um, um, no, that's a very uh, interesting point and, and, and very well taken on, on, let's say, the concrete actions uh, that the younger generation is looking for, for as an example for the value of the transatlantic partnership. I think that's a very good point. Um, we have five minutes left, and so I wanted to, um, to get your kind of... Um, closing uh, statement in a very brief manner and, and just picking back on the introductory remarks you all made, there, you all had some element of, let's say, a positive uh, outlook towards a transatlantic relationship. So I would like you to um, maybe uh, single out one topic or one uh, potential opportunity in the coming years in a transatlantic relationship that you are the most hopeful about. Um, I know that's maybe a challenge, but yeah, to, to the, I think that is a good way to end on a, on a positive note. Um, Michael, can I start with you uh, and go down the same line as we did uh, for the introductory remarks? Sure. No, I'd be happy to. Uh, and, you know, I, I think there's actually a number of topics where we can uh, achieve a lot. If I had to pick one, I would say it would be uh, managing climate change and both our ability to take the Paris Accord to a new level through the new COP negotiations, uh, but then also working together on joint R&D on new energy technologies, working together on things like energy efficiency, which is a huge field uh, and that offers enormous benefits uh, and, and a lot more in terms of sort of carbon border tax adjustments, those sorts of things. But I, I think I'd like to actually end on a sort of a more strategic note which is to say that I, I think the key for the US-EU relationship going forward is to try to harvest precisely those sorts of agreements and areas of cooperation that are non-controversial, where we do largely see eye to eye. And there are plenty of them. Uh, climate change is just, you know, some of the things I mentioned there are just, are just one example. Uh, but the whole governance and resilience issue that I mentioned earlier is another. Um, and, and try not to get our wires crossed on, on some of the issues where clearly we don't yet see eye to eye. Maybe over the course of the next two, three years, we'll be able to align our both our strategic visions and our tactical visions of how to achieve some of these things. But right now we're not we're not yet there. So let's not you sort of jump straight to those, uh, you know, maybe uh, Western Chinese, uh, uh, you know, issues over freedom of navigation. Let, 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 let's leave that for another day and let's focus on those discrete areas where we do see eye to eye and where there is uh, a lot of runway for us to achieve immediate results. Thank you, Michael. Um, Ambassador O'Sullivan, uh, what would be your main uh, hopeful yeah. outlook? I mean, I would also have, have picked climate change as the, the area where I think if you want, if you just want to pick one thing immediately, which we, we have a challenge now for COP26 uh, with the British uh, presidency uh, in, 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 in the autumn, uh, I think dealing with that, making a success of that uh, is, 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 is a very good one. Um, I mean, just to sort of, uh, I mean, I also agree with Michael that, you know, let's try and find things where we can find early agreement. I mean, to Anne's point about demonstrating practical results, let's, let's find some things where we can get stuff done. Uh, and, and, you know, that's, that's a conversation that needs to be had, frankly, at a relatively high level to figure out what are the things where we think we can do that fairly quickly. Um, I, I also think, though, that we should invest. I mean, my, Bart was kind of talking about institution building. I'm, you, you know, I've already talked about my, my, my conviction about people to people, about, about some sort of institution building uh, to try and put the transatlantic relationship on a more secure footing also to better deal with some of the ups and downs of our domestic politics, which are not, which are not going to disappear. We're not going to take those out of the system, right? We can't exclude that a uh, uh, Trump 2.0 or Mr. Trump himself or somebody else will, will get elected in 2024. One well, of the things we need to try and do now, not that prevents that person from exercising their, their democratic mandate when they get it, uh, or on the European side, the same thing, but that just creates links and binds that then just make this a more natural partnership and that it's not entirely dependent on the ups and downs of, of our respective leaderships and, and political configurations. Uh, to me, that goes with people to people. It goes maybe with much more intense uh, congressional uh, uh, contacts with uh, the European Parliament, but also with national parliaments. Um, 
build, building in some of these structural things to 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 get us more often on the same page than we currently are uh, would be, in my view, something worth thinking about. Absolutely. Uh, and partnerships across a broader level uh, is, is what I hear there. Yes, absolutely. Um, um, uh, could I uh, switch to you for uh, your final thoughts here? Yes, if I may. I, I think there are three areas on which cooperation, the broad outline of cooperation is quite non-contentious. Indeed, climate change, finding the pandemic and curtailing Russian aggression. Other than that, we will have to wait a little bit for the policy reviews to finish. But coming back on an earlier point, I do not think that a, um, a value-based approach or a pragmatic approach are mutually exclusive. I think there is a glue there and that glue is dialogue. And we can count on the US and Europeans to have a constructive dialogue as of now. And another thing that can form the glue is personal connections as we look forward, not to the past of transatlantic relationships, but as we reinvent it, dialogue and personal connections will prove indispensable. Indeed, uh, dialogue and uh, a, a more solid foundation. Um, Bart, uh, your final uh, observations? Yeah, just very briefly, I would say, just to follow up on Anne's remarks, uh, on Russia, I'm quite optimistic that, you know, the days of uh, being pushed over by Russia, as we witnessed over the past four years, are over, and it's time for pushback against Russia. And it's striking that, you know, over the past four years, it was Europe, actually, that held the line in terms of uh, san maintaining sanctions against Russia and the very uh, strong stance towards it and in support of Ukraine and uh, democratic reform elsewhere as well. And uh, it's great that now the U.S. administration has uh, that forceful approach towards Russia as well. And that transatlantically, we can get a lot of stuff done uh, more so because it's not just at this point, you know, it's not just uh, Russia's invasion of eastern Ukraine, uh, annexation of, of Crimea, but there's a long list of um, uh, issues that we have against Russia, electoral interference, cyber attacks, uh, poisonings, you know, the list goes on and on. And it, is, it really is a time for pushback. The, to close on a, a hopeful note, let me just pick up on a thread that David uh, alluded to, which is that, you know, in terms of thinking about new institutions and new ways of doing things, it was heartening to see the European Council President, Charles Michel, uh, discuss a potential new founding pact, in his words, uh, for the transatlantic partnership. Uh, and I took it to mean that, you know, there needs to be some sort of restatement of principles, sort of a new Atlantic charter, whatever you want to call it, uh, that both recommits us to a certain set of common values, but also outlines some joint action that we will uh, pursue. And I think it's just a way of, you know, focusing minds together so that we, again, uh, in uh, President Biden's words, as well as HRVP Burrell's words, we treat each other as partners of first resort because that's what fundamentally uh, we are. Thank you indeed, uh, Bert, for, for the, on that last note of uh, partners of first resorts. Um, I want to thank the panelists for a great discussion. Um, thank you so much for, for all your insights. Um, we've had also a great amount of participants. I think we hit almost 300 people uh, at some point listening in. Um, so thank you very much for joining this GMF event. And I look forward to uh, being in touch with you in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks to my colleagues on the panel. Thank you, everyone.